Hello and welcome everyone. Hello, this is Aurora with Supercharged Science. <laughs> this is, let me try this again. This is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Hello and welcome. This is Aurora, with, who's been working way too hard. <laughs> this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society, and tonight we're going to be doing a, a, a very special presentation. I know I'm a little bit early. I wanted to answer a couple of the emails that have been coming in lately to the Central Coast Astronomical Society. So let me just, I want to just take a few minutes before we get started so you can adjust your audio levels and go get your popcorn and your cookies <laughs> and save me some so um, so everything's ready to go when our speaker comes on okay so uh, really quick we um, we've been getting a number of emails asking uh, from folks asking if they can become a member of CCAS even if they don't live in this area the answer is yes of course um, we are happy to have you as a member of our society not a problem at all and to do that you simply go to our website which is www.centralcoastastronomy.org and you can just click on membership on that and you're welcome to join us it's twenty dollars a, a year so it's not very much it helps support our club and our telescopes and the scope loaner program that we have and you will be personally invited to our online members only events that we have so that's I hope that answers that question for you um, the next question we've been getting a lot of is how long will you be doing these things online and the answer is we have no idea <laughs> so we are doing these live events as long as we are unable to meet in person to stargaze and we just got word yesterday that it's going to be at least a couple of more months before we are allowed to come together with our telescopes and stargaze as a, uh, as an astronomy club so we are planning to continue the astronomy series we've been doing throughout the summer so um so if you're enjoying these well you get to enjoy them even more <laughs> so we're going to continue to do that that. We actually have some really special, um, uh, to bring in some variety, some new things that are coming up that I'm really excited about as well. Several of our members are going to be giving you private tours of their personal observatories. So they're working on videos and working on some special um, live events just for, just for you so you can kind of see what a telescope setup looks like. Um, so that will be that will be coming as well. We also have other astronomers that are going to help out with our monthly stargazing and helping answer questions. And so you'll actually get to interact with them as well. There's been a number of them that have been jumping on answering questions that come in the chat box and so forth. So you'll get to meet them. OK, so we are just about near the top of the hour. So if you are joining us for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. This is something that we would normally meet in person and we would all get together there'd be cookies in the back so I wasn't kidding about the cookies before <laughs> and we would all get together we talk about astronomy talk about telescopes stargazing all of those things and then um, we would all be sitting down for a guest presentation guest speaker and then when they, we all uh, as soon as that guest presentation is over then we'd have a, a lively interaction discussion and usually it wraps up in about 90 minutes tonight's presentation is probably only about 30 to 45 minutes so it's a lot shorter so if you do have questions as we go through to our talk tonight, make sure you put it in the comments box. And actually, everyone that has that ability right now, um, go ahead and take your fingers out, put them on the typewriter, tell us your name and also where you're from so we can get a better idea of um, who our audience is so we can better serve you. Um, this also helps us with stargazing so we know exactly which parts of the world we should be talking about stargazing with. Um, for example, Last month when we did the June stargazing, we had folks from all over, including Australia and South Africa and the UK and Singapore. So it was helpful to know who our audience was so we could talk about the skies in their area. So that just helps us astronomically speaking. <laughs> okay, so at the top of the hour, we are going to go ahead and get started. I am so excited you've joined us. Now we're actually dual streaming tonight. So we are um, not only streaming to YouTube, but we're also streaming to Facebook. If you know of anyone that would be interested in this presentation for tonight just let them know just go ahead and share this link with anybody else that you can think of so uh, we can continue to add value and bring astronomy to the general public that's what we're really passionate about and my name is Aurora I'm the uh, president of the Central Coast Astronomical Society and let me show you just really quick really quick on our website here. If you'd like to find out more information about us, go to www.centralcoastastronomy.org. 
So Central Coast Astronomy, just like in the bottom of that slide that you see there. Okay, and you will see that we have um, a website set up and you can check it out. On this page are all the events that we have. We have club meetings. Tonight, of course, is our guest speaker. And we also have our upcoming events. So if you're interested in stargazing, how to do that from home, um, these are all our, our virtual events. And you can see we have quite a few of them that we've done. Um, all the past events are also recorded. So if you've missed one, if you missed June, no problem. Just go back here and click on it and you'll be able to watch it. Okay, and so we have our members only hangout, which is the end of, this, of July. And we also have our next star online stargazing open to the public. Everyone don't have to be a member. Um, this is July 18th at 7 p.m. Pacific. So mark your calendars. So next time we will be getting together to do star stargazing is on the 18th. Okay, so those are our announcements for now. This is the last um, pre uh, astronomy presentation that we will be giving until September. So this is, we usually take a break over the summer because there's so much great stargazing to do. So that's kind of what we put our focus on. Okay, so if you are new to Central Coast Astronomy, again, if you just joined us, my name's Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society, and I encourage you to use the chat box, use it to answer questions. Brian is monitoring it tonight, and so he will be able to answer any astronomy questions that you have that you can just simply type in the box. Just let us know who you are, where you're calling from, or calling, listen to me, <laughs> where you're connecting from, and um, so we can just uh, extend a special welcome to you. Okay, so for tonight, Tonight's presentation is a very special presentation. Now this is um, the, the individual I'm gonna be bringing up. Um, Madeline is a very special friend of one of our, one of our founding astronomers uh, for the club. Now the club was founded way back in 1979. And so what was really special about this is that uh, Madeline has a passion for astronomy, but it isn't her primary subject of focus in, in that's not what she's studying primarily. But I'm gonna let her introduce that. Uh, what's really cool is what she's really passionate about and she's going to share her vision and the work that she's been doing to kind of bring history to life today and share it with the public. And so this is a little bit different. Normally we talk about optics or telescopes or the latest exoplanets or something like that. But I thought that this one would be particularly of interest just because when you get into astronomy, there's also a love of history that comes out and it's really rare that you can actually see those both working together and actually coming together into a project that will actually happen today. So that's really cool. So I really hope you're gonna enjoy tonight's presentation. Um, we will be reading questions to Madeline at the end of her presentation. So make sure you do type in your questions. You can also text them. I completely forgot to tell you that. Um, you can text them to the phone number if it's too fuzzy to read on your screen. It's 805-242-6415. I'll read it one more time. So you can text your questions. She'll get them as well. 805-242-6415. You can also email your questions to questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. Okay, so we are gonna go ahead <laughs> and get started. I'm going to bring Madeline on. I'm gonna start my slides here and start my presentation uh, with her. So let's go ahead and see if we can find Madeline. Madeline, are you there? Hey, Madeline. Hello. I'm sorry. I think I was muted, so you didn't hear me introduce you. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, go ahead and start talking so I can set your audio levels, and then you get to take it away. Okay. Um, well, I'm excited to be talking tonight. Um, I'm not sure what else I should say, but <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, should I go ahead and start or? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to share this work. Um, let me just share my screen here. Are people able to see the slides? Okay, great. All right, so this talk comes out of work that I conducted um, with Neil Curtis and Sam Lemley, who are two friends and colleagues in the English department at the University of Virginia, where I am a graduate student. I'll say a little bit more later on um, about why three graduate students in English became interested in a project involving astronomy. 
Um, but I do want to note that this talk will be more historical than scientific. I, I am excited, though, to be speaking before an audience that knows a lot more about astronomy than I do. So I really look forward to hearing your questions and your insights at the end. Um, and so what I'll do today is provide kind of a background, historical background for this project, and then talk a little bit about um, the exhibit and art installation that the three of us launched. A second here. I find I'm not able to advance my slides. Okay. So in 1819, Thomas Jefferson was in the midst of planning the University of Virginia. Rows of houses and classrooms on the UVA lawn, which you can see depicted here, um, had already been built, and the basic architectural footprint of the university was in place. However, Jefferson was still in the process of designing the architectural centerpiece of his university, the Rotunda, which is the large dome top building that you can see in the middle of this engraving. And this was modeled on the Pantheon in Rome. Jefferson's plan for this building was quite ambitious. Um, as planned, the Rotunda would have three stories and it would include space for a natural history museum, chemical laboratories and classrooms. The top floor of the building would be the dome room uh, with the ceiling that curved up to a glass covered oculus or a skylight. When the rotunda opened in 1826, the dome room ceiling was plain white plaster, but this wasn't always the plan. Jefferson's notebooks from 1819 contain a pretty unusual idea for the rotunda that, if executed, would have made the building the first planetarium-like structure in the United States. So this is what Jefferson writes in his notebook. The concave ceiling of the rotunda is proposed to be painted sky blue and spangled with gilt stars in their position and magnitude copied exactly from any selected hemisphere of our latitude. A seat for the operator, movable and fixable at any point in the concave, will be necessary and means of giving to every star its exact position. And I'll talk a little bit more about how this plan would have worked. Um, but the, the takeaway at this moment is that it would have allowed for manipulation of movable gilt stars that could represent the progress of constellations across the night sky. So if not exactly a model of the solar system, um, it was sort of planetarium-like. Before I get to Jefferson's plan, I want to talk a little bit about some possible inspirations for this idea. So ceilings with stars or constellations are not a new phenomenon. Uh, this is a carved ceiling from Egypt created around 50 BCE. In the center of the image, uh, supposedly there is uh, the North Pole star, which is surrounded by constellations represented here as signs of the zodiac. And the design also apparently depicts two solar eclipses. Here's another example, uh, slightly later. It's a star ceiling that was found in a 12th century Chinese tomb. And this tomb actually had a domed ceiling um, painted with constellations, which are those dots and lines that you can see. So there's no evidence that Jefferson knew anything about structures exactly like these ones, but I'm showing them to make the point that star painted ceilings have been around for a really long time. It is more likely that Jefferson would have heard about astronomical displays in Europe. So here's an example um, of one that he may have heard of. This is the Issa Isinga Planetarium in the Netherlands. Not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but it was built in the late 18th century by Isinga, who was an amateur astronomer. And it's basically a mechanical orrery or model of the solar system that hangs from the ceiling and rotates under the power of a pendulum clock. It's also still working, which is pretty remarkable. This is not a ceiling, but it's another possible European inspiration. Uh, this is called the Globe of Gottorf. Uh, which German craftsmen built for Peter the Great during the 17th century. And it's basically a globe, it's 3.1 meters in diameter, that rotates by water power 
And the idea was that you, the visitor, could sit inside this globe and watch as constellations powered by water moved across the interior of the globe. So these structures are very cool, and I think they're a testament to the artistic as well as scientific innovation that has historically accompanied interest in astronomy. But as a scholar of literature, there's one further possibility that I want to float. So Jefferson was a big fan of the French Enlightenment philosopher and writer Voltaire. And in Voltaire's 1768 novella, uh, La Princesse de Babylon, he imagines a planetarium in the gardens of his fictional Babylon. So in this passage, Voltaire describes a circular room 300 feet in diameter with a vaulted roof painted blue and seeded with gold stars representing all the constellations and planets, each in its true position. He also adds a little bit later that this spangled vault rotated so that the sky was moved by machines as invisible as those that move the cosmos. So if you compare these passages from Voltaire and Jefferson, the similarities are quite suggestive. Obviously, I have put Voltaire in translation here, but the basic idea that he proposes maps pretty well onto Jefferson's plan. And so you can see this with a, a quick comparison. So in each passage, you have a painted blue ceiling. You have gold or gilt stars. And you have this interest in scientific accuracy, so stars in their exact or their true position. We'll never know for sure what inspired Jefferson, um, but we do know a bit more about how he thought this idea would work. So this is the original sketch that he provides. Um, this is his label diagram of the planetarium. And specifically, it's a diagram of the boom and pulley lift that would elevate an operator to give lectures and point to stars on the rotunda ceiling. Um, as far as I can tell, the design is basically completely unsafe. Uh, an operator would sit in a horse saddle affixed to a thin white oak boom or a pole mounted to the base of the dome room. This boom could then be raised and lowered by a rope allowing the operator to travel around the dome. Um, we actually had a mechanical engineer look at the dimensions that Jefferson proposed for the wooden boom, and he concluded that it would have been incredibly bendy. Um, so I think it, it would have been, as designed, a pretty bumpy ride. And actually, there was a, f uh, a few years ago a short article about this design in the Virginia Alumni Magazine, um, and this is the illustration that accompanied the article. So it's, it's pretty wild. Then finally, uh, there would have been a fixed wooden rib on the interior of the dome. And a person could have climbed up this to adjust the gilt stars in their different quadrants, moving the stars as the year progressed and the constellations changed positions. So it's worth noting that when the rotunda opened in 1826, um, Oh, just a moment. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm hitting the mic. So I will <laughs> I will stop doing that. Okay. All right. Um, so what was I going to say? Okay, so so when the rotunda opened in 1826, um, the people who would have been climbing up this frame and adjusting the stars um, would likely have been enslaved. And we know that one enslaved man, um, his name is Louis Commodore, was charged with the upkeep of the early rotunda, and he actually lived in the building for a while. Um, Commodore also helped run experiments that were conducted in the chemical hearth located on the rotunda's ground floor. Unfortunately, there are limited records about his life, um, but he is described in one letter written by an early university student as having, quote, a smart practical knowledge of chemistry. And in another letter, a student describes him as a classical scholar. So Thomas Jefferson, of course, um, promoted racist theories about the abilities of people of African descent. 
Um, but the university that he created actually depended on the intellectual and scientific labor, as well as physical labor, of African Americans like Louis Commodore. Um, and this takes us a little bit away from um, the subject at hand here, but if you're interested in learning more about this history, um, I suggest that you check out Educated in Tyranny, which uh, includes a chapter on Commodore and is just a fascinating recent history um, by some historians at UVA. So what Lewis Commodore ends up doing in the Rotunda Dome Room instead of moving around constellations is keeping the library clean. And that's because the Dome Room becomes the University of Virginia's first library. So Jefferson abandons his planetarium idea. We don't know why. Um, we do know that he's still considering the plan as late as July 1824, when he writes to John Vaughn, who at that time is the librarian of the American Philosophical Society. And Jefferson asks Vaughn if there are any fresco painters in Philadelphia. And as he tells Vaughn, we shall need one to paint the ceiling of our rotunda. In response, Vaughn informs Jefferson that no, there aren't any fresco painters in Philadelphia, and Jefferson will probably need to employ an artist from Europe. At this point, there have already been a lot of delays to the rotunda's construction, and Jefferson is way over budget, um, so the dome stays unadorned. That said, Jefferson remains very committed to teaching astronomy at the University of Virginia. This is somewhat unusual because most early 19th century American universities are not that focused on the sciences. Jefferson, however, invests a lot of money in buying scientific books, including a large collection of astronomy books, which end up in this library. He also purchases a number of scientific instruments, including a selection of astronomical instruments from Tuther and Carey, who are a London-based firm that specializes in optical instruments and scientific instruments. So these include, these um, items that Jefferson wants to purchase include a refracting telescope, a theodolite, a sextant, and an azimuth compass. Unfortunately, none of these instruments survive at the university. Um, we think that some of them were sold off at one point to finance the construction of UVA's observatory, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, um, but otherwise they just kind of disappeared. I was able to find for tonight just a few pictures of instruments that were produced during this time period, some by Tuther and Carey, who um, Jefferson would have purchased instruments from. So this is a slightly smaller telescope than the one Jefferson orders. Um, and I, I think also one with a different kind of mount, um, but it is by that same instrument maker. Here's a late 18th century theodolite. And as you may know, this is an instrument used to measure angles between points, which means that it was very important for land surveying and for creating maps during this period. A sextant, again, by Carrie London, important for creating nautical charts. And an azimuth compass, also important for navigation at sea. So as part of our project, my colleagues and I invited Sarah Schechner to give a talk about Jefferson's instrument collecting. Dr. Schechner directs the Harvard Scientific Instrument Collection, and she's also a specialist in the history of astronomy. Um, some of you may be familiar with her really fantastic work. She pointed out that the instruments Jefferson buys for the early university and the kinds of questions that Jefferson himself has about astronomy are not actually that focused on pure scientific discovery. Uh, and she finds that the most sort of telling evidence of Jefferson's attitude to astronomy is when the transit of Venus happens in 1769. This is the big astronomical event of the 18th century. And some early Americans, such as the astronomer David Rittenhouse, um, who was friends with Jefferson, are extremely excited by this event, and they write really extensively about it. Jefferson, by contrast, observes the transit, but he doesn't really have that much to say. I think in his notebook, he says something like, we looked, but it was cloudy that day. 
Um, so what Jefferson really values astronomy for is its importance for surveying and navigation. Um, in other words, he thinks astronomy is important because it can help people figure out how to make maps, how to determine geographic borders, and how to claim new territory. And I think this is really interesting because a lot of the rhetoric surrounding Jefferson as a scientist um, emphasizes that he was a scholar. But Scheffner's research suggests that Jefferson's investment in science is actually much more about practical use um, and even conquest. And in fact, the first person that he tries to hire to teach astronomy at the University of Virginia is Nathaniel Bowditch, who is sort of popularly known as the father of modern maritime navigation. So again, he, he wants someone practical for this job. Um, Bowditch actually ends up declining the post, however. So Jefferson dies in 1826. He doesn't lead, live to see the rotunda completed. Um, but what happens at, to astronomy at the university after his death is also sort of an interesting story. So in 1830, the university finally hires its first professor of natural philosophy, which is the category that included um, astronomy. And that's this guy, Robert Maskell Patterson. Patterson has at the University of Virginia, a small brick house erected on a hill south of the university, and he equips it with a telescope. Um, and he models the building on the National Observatory in Washington, DC. However, Patterson only stays at the University of Virginia for a few years. He leaves five years later to become the director of the US Mint. And when he leaves, the university is already short on funds and he's not replaced. So astronomy at the university is then basically neglected until after the Civil War. Um, it has a resurgence in the early 1870s when the Chicago businessman Leander McCormick donates money to the university to build a new building and buy another refracting telescope. So the McCormick Observatory opens in 1885 at the time, its telescope, which was made by Alvin Clark, was the second largest telescope in the United States. And as you can see, this observatory is still standing today. It's mostly used now uh, for teaching and for public events. So at this point, I want to start shifting from the past to the present. As I mentioned, the Rotunda Dome was the university's first library. Unfortunately, the rotunda burned in 1895, leading to the destruction of many books. The building was restored, um, but the collection ultimately outgrew the space and the University of Virginia eventually moved the library to another building. A few years ago, two fellow graduate students and I became interested in the history of this first library. Specifically, we were interested in figuring out which of the books originally purchased by Jefferson might have survived that fire. And we also wanted to know if there were things we could learn about early users of the library by looking at surviving physical copies of the first library's books. And I'd be happy to talk more about that project uh, in the Q&A. In the process of doing this research, we learned about Jefferson's planetarium idea. It wasn't an entirely new discovery. People sort of knew that Jefferson had this idea but it also wasn't a piece of history that people had really paid that much attention to. And we thought that it would be interesting to reimagine this idea for the 21st century. So this is the rotunda today. It's mostly used for meetings and lectures. Um, you can also hold your dissertation defense in there if you want. Our team, uh, though, wanted to direct visitors' attention to the building's past as a site of interdisciplinary research and discovery. And we wanted an opportunity to share research about the different people who worked, studied, and in the case of Lewis Commodore, lived under the building's dome. Um, so we created the Rotunda Planetarium Project, which uses laser projectors to turn the Rotunda Dome into an image of the night sky. Um, here's a little glimpse of it here, and that's me, Sam, and Neil, uh, my two collaborators. 
And here is a better view of the whole dome. So this design approximately replicates the night sky of the Northern Hemisphere as it would have looked in October 1826, which is when the rotunda first opened to the public. Unfortunately, the oculus at the top prevents us from displaying the whole hemisphere, um, but it, we tried to get it sort of relatively accurate in terms of star position um, from our limited expertise as English students. So that red circle there is Polaris, the North Star, and that's on the north side of the dome. So how did we do this? We were able to project our images from the upper gallery of the dome room um, using five laser projectors, each connected to a small single board computer. And so you can see there kind of two thirds of the way down, that's the upper gallery, which is close to the public. And here's a closer view of the projector. And these are just standard projectors of the sort that you'll now find in many college classrooms. We did end up projecting static images, um, which was just easier to manage, but I think maybe in a future iteration, we might figure out how to make things rotate. Okay, so the constellation images that we designed are inspired by illustrations in John Flamsteed's 1729 Star Atlas. We chose this book as the basis for our design because Jefferson purchased a copy of it for the university's library. So early University of Virginia students might have looked at these images while learning about astronomy in the early 19th century. And you'll notice that in our design, we kept the colors black and white instead of Jefferson's proposed blue and gold. Uh, this was partly a way to reference the print origins of the images. The Flamsteed Atlas is also significant because it was the first star atlas based on telescopic observations and it ended up serving as the standard reference for professional astronomers for almost a century. And here are just a few images from Flamsteed. So that's the Northern Hemisphere, the basis for our design. And here's a closer view of the constellation Cygnus, um, which includes the Northern Cross star formation. And that's our version on the right. And one thing you'll notice is that we uh, were more artistic with our stars uh, rather than scientifically accurate. So they don't represent um, changing brightnesses of stars. So it's, it's more sort of just the effect. So to complement this projection, we mounted a small exhibition in the now empty bookcases that ring the Rotunda Dome Room, the bookcases that would have held books and artifacts when the Rotunda was still being used as a library. And this exhibit helped us provide a broader context for thinking about astronomy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And it also allowed us to highlight some scientific voices outside the academy, a reminder that science can happen everywhere, not just in universities. And to end today, I just want to highlight a few items from that exhibit. Um, these were mostly things that were lent to us by local collectors, um, and then a few things are owned by UVA, and then we had a few high quality reproductions. So first up is this almanac created by Nathaniel Ames in the mid 18th century. As you may know, almanacs are annual publications that provided 18th and 19th century readers with information about weather forecasts, tide tables, eclipse dates, and sometimes more specialized advice. In other words, though, they communicated astronomical knowledge to general audiences. And we can actually see that this edition of Ames's Almanac features a cover image depicting the solar system and the path of a comet. And inside uh, the Almanac contains a short article about comets and planets. So everyday people were reading this material and starting to learn about some of the science. By the early 19th century, astronomy was popular uh, increasingly with middle-class white children. The cartographer Edward Mogg designed this cardboard dissected globe for hands-on instruction in basic astronomical principles. The idea was that children would learn about geography and astronomy by putting together and playing with these small models. 
The dissected globe that you can see on the right here is the terrestrial version showing Earth. And the assembled one on the left is the celestial version showing the positions of stars in the sky. And for our exhibit, we uh, were actually able just to print off uh, a reproduction of the Mogs globe and assemble it ourselves, which if you're looking for a fun quarantine activity, I can recommend. Authors also developed astronomy textbooks for young readers. And one famous textbook author was the 18th century English natural philosopher, Margaret Bryan, who was also a strong proponent of scientific education for women. She's shown here with her two daughters surrounded by the tools of her trade, which include a telescope, a globe, and a prism and a rotating holder. Jefferson, unfortunately, didn't purchase a copy of Brian for his library. This is one of those things that a local collector made available to us. But in buying Flamsteed's atlas, he actually did inadvertently support the work of another female astronomer. Although the atlas credits John Flamsteed as its creator, the book was published posthumously by Flamsteed's wife, Margaret. Margaret Flamsteed helped her husband calculate many of the measurements for the atlas, um, and if it wasn't for her, that work would never have ended up in the rotunda. The last couple of items that I want to showcase relate to Benjamin Banneker, who was a free black astronomer, farmer, and polymath who lived in 18th century Maryland. Banneker is probably best known as the creator of an almanac series. Um, for some reason, his name is spelled differently on this particular version of the cover, um, but that's supposed to be an engraving of him there. His almanac is especially famous because he sent a letter containing a manuscript copy to none other than Thomas Jefferson. And in this letter, Banneker challenges Jefferson's support of slavery and his dismissal of black intellect in Notes on the State of Virginia, um, which is a book that Jefferson writes in 1781. Banneker also calls attention to the fact that he does all the calculations for his almanac without a formal education. As Banneker writes, this calculation, sir, is the production of my arduous study in this my advanced stage of life for having long had unbounded desires to become acquainted with the secrets of nature, I have had to gratify my curiosity herein through my own assiduous application to astronomical study." So Banneker is largely self-taught. Um, he is, however, able to borrow a limited supply of books and equipment from his neighbor, Andrew Ellicott. And actually, as part of a team led by Ellicott, Banneker also puts his mathematical and astronomical knowledge to work by helping survey the borders of Washington, DC, um, although he is paid less than white members of the surveying team. During this time, Banneker keeps a journal that is pretty fascinating. Shown here is a sketch of a solar eclipse over Washington. And also of astronomical note um, is a section in the journal that includes early predictions of exoplanets or planets outside the solar system, which I find pretty remarkable considering that we can't for sure prove that exoplanets exist um, until much, much later, I think the 1990s. So I'm not a scientist, but I like the stories of these early scientists like Banneker because I see them as a reminder that while well, research and learning can definitely benefit from fancy modern equipment or expensive libraries, these things are nothing without curiosity and patience and close observation. One of our goals with Rotunda Planetarium was to find a relatively low tech way to encourage visitors to look up and notice different things. And I hope that maybe this project will inspire other people to create something that sparks discovery and imagination and invites people to see differently. Um, and if you are curious about the project or you want to get in touch, we do have a website. That's it up on the screen there. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have.
That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that he had um, several telescopes at Monticello. Um, and when I was talking earlier about the transit of Venus, um, the sort of big astronomical event of the 18th century, he observes that from his home at Monticello. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, Monticello, of course, also has a dome. It doesn't have an oculus at the top, so stargazing a little difficult. Um, but I, I would be happy to find out more and report back to you. But thank you. Okay, great, great. All right, um, let's uh, let's move on. That's a great question. I love it when people ask good questions. Okay, um, any plans to invite students to draw illustrations for constellations, maybe as an astronomy outreach? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So we were able to, before the pandemic, host a number of public nights um, with the projection up. And these engaged UVA students and then also members of the broader Charlottesville community. Um, and so for one of those nights, we partnered with a group of astronomy grad students who led some of the younger visitors in a kind of like draw your own constellation uh, activity, which was really cool. I think, you know, if we're able to start up again, that's something that we would love to develop. Um, we also would be really excited to see people use those projectors that we've set up to project, you know, their own images, whether astronomical or something else. So that's definitely something that we'll be working on. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, and I understand that um, uh, I was muted for the first question. So the first question she answered was, um, did Jefferson ever have any plans to um, ever consider building an observatory in Monticello? And so that was the first question she answered. Okay, so the next question, let me see here. The next question is, um, okay, how did they, how did you decide what constellations to put on the ceiling when the 88 constellations we know of today weren't decided to like the early 1920s, I want to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is where we kind of let the Flansteed be our guide. Um, we wanted to depict the like constellations of the zodiac um, somewhat because they are like more artistic and interesting to look at. And we had difficulty projecting stars of different brightnesses, um, but also because this was sort of the icon astronomical iconography that would have been familiar to a lot of people in the 18th and 19th century. Um, so the, the decision was not really that scientific, I'm afraid. It was more just sort of like what would evoke the feeling of being in a kind of 19th century planetarium like structure. And we, you know, we, as I said, we were limited by the presence of the Oculus. So we tried to figure out what would map from the hemisphere um, depicted in Flamsteed's Atlas onto the space that we were able to project on. So the architecture also kind of constrained our decision making there a little bit too. Um, all right, perfect. Are you up for another question? <laughs> People are really loving that you yeah. are putting um, history together with science and we especially have a lot of Jefferson lovers out there. So this is right up people's alley. Um, <laughs> okay, so the question is, have you had an opportunity to tie in a planetarium display through some observing through telescopes afterwards? Yeah, um, that's something that we haven't done yet. Um, we have talked with some folks in the astronomy department at UVA about the possibility of sort of reconfiguring the projection so that it could be used for classroom teaching and then maybe translate to an outdoor activity. Um, that's something that's a little, a little bit beyond our own expertise, um, but again, it's kind of a collaboration that we definitely would like to pursue um, if we're able to kind of get back in the space in the future. 
Got it. Hang on. I've got to unmute both microphones in order for people to hear me now. Okay. Okay, great. Got it. Well, thank you so much. I'm checking to see if there's any other questions that have come in. We have a lot of people saying thank you so, so much. Um, so uh, for those of you who are, uh, who well, for those of you who are watching, thank you for joining us. Um, go ahead and type Madeline a note. I'm going to actually copy all of the comments and send it to her. So your thanks and kudos and any thoughts that you wanted to share and something specific that you really enjoyed about her talk will get delivered straight to her. So if you'd like to do that, please put it in the comment box. Just drop it in there right now so we can forward that to her as well. Uh, Madeline, do you have anything else you'd like to share with everyone? Um, just thank you so much. And yeah, if, if you have more thoughts or questions about the project that come up later, um, I really do encourage you to get in touch. This is kind of, you know, a project that's like still in progress. So um, we're especially excited to hear from astronomers who have, you know, skills and knowledge far beyond our own. But yeah, thank you for letting me come and, and share this with you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Whoops. Sorry, wrong screen. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Madeline. I will be in touch with you later. So, but thank you so much. Those of you who are still here, stay here. We're going to say goodbye to Madeline first, and then I've got a quick announcement at the end. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. I will be in touch with you by email uh, shortly. All right. Great. All right. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. All right. Wasn't that amazing? It's incredible what you can learn just in 30 minutes. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us. I just wanted to do a quick announcement. And we've had a number of people asking, when are we going to get together again? Um, the announcement I made at the beginning was that we, this was the last um, talk that we are going to have until September. We'll be emailing out our subscribers. If you like what you see and you would like more, subscribe to our channel, uh, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. You can also join our email list, which is at centralcoastastronomy.org. Um, it's free. You can jump on there and then you will get emails from me personally every time we have one of these. So you'll get a, like an email reminder. Um, so if that's something you'd like to do as well, but go ahead and um, you can like us and follow us and that way you'll be also notified when we do these live broadcasts. Um, as for stargazing, we're not able to stargaze for at least another couple of months, which means July 18th is your next date for stargazing online with myself and Kent. We actually are arranging for also um, private observatory tours so you can actually see what an observatory looks like for an uh, amateur astronomer you know what does their telescope looks like what, what does their setup look like and you can ask them questions and interact and and so much more so we're putting that together as well so thank you all for joining us tonight if you do have questions let us know um, I'm Aurora at centralcoastastronomy.org and you're welcome to put any questions in the chat box. Everyone say thank you to Brian. He's our moderator. He's actually from the Riverside Astronomy Club. And so he's just donating and he's, he's helping us. He's been donating his time from since March um, to help us out as well. So thank you to Brian. And thank you to all the astronomers that are on tonight. Um, there's Glenn and I saw Dave and I saw a number of people that, uh, so I miss you all. <laughs> and I can't wait to, um, for us all to get back together and just stargaze and just have a lot of fun. But in the meantime, we're making the of it if you would like any um, if you have any ideas or feedback for our club please do let me know aurora at centralcoastastronomy.org and i will see you guys um i will see you on july 18th for stargazing um oh boy there's a bunch of things that just came in just clicked um let's see any final questions uh final questions Okay, well, um, if you do have questions, just email them in. Uh, again, our website, I'll put it up here as a closing slide. So thank you all, and I will see you, gosh, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Take care.